We first use complex numbers to talk about square roots of negative numbers. We know that these are not real numbers. We have a way of representing these numbers using the letter i. Square root of negative 1 we define as equal to i. From there we can simplify other square roots of negative numbers. Since we know the square root of 4 equals 2, the square root of negative 4 equals 2i. And if we encounter radicals that are irrational, we would still like to simplify them. Square root of negative 12 equals 2 radical 3i. This prepares us to deal with solutions to quadratic equations that are complex numbers. We know we have a quadratic equation that will give us complex solutions by looking at the discriminant. That's the quantity b squared minus 4ac, where a, b, and c are the coefficients of this equation in standard form. b squared minus 4ac, now in this case, a, b, and c are each equal to positive 1, and our discriminant is negative 3. When we plug that quantity into the quadratic formula, we would see these two solutions. Whenever the discriminant is negative is when we come up with a negative quantity in the square root in the quadratic formula, so it must be a complex solution. We would simplify this square root of negative 3 just by bringing an i outside of the radical. x equals negative 1 plus or minus i radical 3 over 2, and we could take this number one step further and split it up into two separate fractions. We have only one term in the denominator 2, so it's legit that we split up the numerator, and we end up with the real part and the imaginary part of this complex number as two very distinct terms. Negative 1 half is the real part. The square root of 3 over 2, the coefficient of i, is the imaginary part. Together they'll make the complex number. And because it was a solution to a quadratic, we know we have two separate answers here negative 1 half plus radical 3 over 2i, and a negative 1 half minus radical 3 over 2i. We begin to see some very interesting and useful things when we plot complex numbers. We do that on a plane with horizontal and vertical axes. Instead of x and y for the axes, we're going to have a real axis and an imaginary axis. The little script re for real and im for imaginary. It's working just like an xy coordinate plane, so these are two number lines to the right positive numbers and to the left negative numbers. So real on the horizontal, the imaginary will be using the coefficient of i. We're going to leave the i off, understand that this vertical axis represents the imaginary part, the coefficient of i. It's a pretty crude sketch of a graph here, but we can figure out approximately where these points are negative 1 half plus radical 3 over 2. So first plot the real part, negative 1 half. We're going to the left, negative 1 half. And if we use positive radical 3 over 2, that's a positive number. We're going up, and we have a point there in quadrant 2. There's the point negative 1 half, radical 3 over 2, just using the real part and the coefficient of the imaginary part. Our other solution, negative 1 half minus radical 3 over 2. So we have the same horizontal negative 1 half, but our vertical is now negative from the negative radical 3 over 2i. And we see these two points are reflections about the horizontal axis, and hopefully these ordered pairs are jumping out at you as well as being familiar from points on the unit circle. We know the angle measures here, the point in quadrant 2 is at 150 degrees, and down here in quadrant 3, 240 degrees. So this complex number, this pair of complex numbers that were solutions to this quadratic equation, when we consider them to be points that we plot, the real part and the imaginary part, we can incorporate our trigonometry knowledge when working with complex numbers. That we don't have to keep them in this a plus bi form, we call it, but we can look at them in terms of their radius and their angle measure, and that's what we're going to do in this video. To continue with these ideas, we're going to use this graph. First of all, horizontally real axis and vertically imaginary axis, and we have vertical and horizontal grids so we can plot ordered pairs, but we also have circles for when we begin to look at rotation, the measure of the angle. I've got a point here, 
It is at 4, 4. This point does correspond to a complex number. The horizontal part is the real part, 4, and the imaginary part is also a positive 4. So it is the complex number 4 plus 4i. The horizontal is our first term. The vertical is the coefficient of our second term, the imaginary term. Now to begin converting this number into its trigonometric form, we are interested in what is the angle, the rotation, if we think back to our standard position here on the horizontal axis and rotating some amount until we hit the point 4 plus 4i, 4, 4. This is the angle that's going to represent this complex number. We will also need to know what is this radius, how far away from the origin do we go. The angle measure we should spot right away. It is this perfect 45 degree angle. It goes through the points 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. It's the line x equals y if, if we were looking at x and y axes. That's 45 degrees. And we also have a way to determine the length of this radius. We know the horizontal and vertical sides of the right triangle. The real part is the horizontal 4. The imaginary part also is 4 and we can use Pythagorean Theorem. Square root of x squared plus y squared is an expression that we're going to be using a lot going forward, so I'm getting used to thinking of just square the horizontal, square the vertical, add them up inside of a square root. Square root of 16 plus 16, a couple of steps here, add it up equals 32. Let's simplify this radical. I know 32 is 16 times 2, so we have 4 times radical 2. There is the length of the radius. So we can describe the complex number 4 plus 4i by using the angle and radius. In general, we could say a complex number in the form a plus bi, knowing that we could plot that point where a, the real part, is the horizontal, and b, the imaginary part, is the vertical, Here's the horizontal and the vertical. Horizontal is r times cosine theta. We know that from trigonometry. It's the horizontal part on the real axis. And r times sine theta will be this vertical component. And that is vertically on the imaginary axis. Since both of these terms use the same value r, we can factor that out. And we'll commonly see in trigonometric form r times this quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta. And that theta, it's going to be just this angle of rotation. So we'll always be seeing the same angle measure in each of those thetas. A shorthand way we could write it would be r times cis theta, or kiss theta. And that stands for cosine theta plus i sine theta. I like to use this abbreviation, but understand that this is really showing us what math is involved. Multiplying the radius times cosine is our horizontal. Multiplying the radius times sine theta is the vertical. And we're using real part on horizontal axis, imaginary part on the vertical axis. This number, 4 plus 4i, we could write it in trig notation as 4 radical 2 kiss 45 degrees. But understand that this means 4 radical 2 times cosine 45 degrees is the horizontal, the real part. 4 radical 2 times sine 45 degrees is the vertical part, the coefficient of i. Writing it with the r factored out front, 4 radical 2 times cosine 45 degrees plus i sine 45 degrees. And understand, this is just another representation of the complex number 4 plus 4i. They are totally equivalent numbers, just written using different notation. Before we continue with a few more examples, I'd like to look at this equation using ideas that we know already to try to make this new trig notation fit in and also to give us a little bit of an idea of some helpful things we see when we look at complex numbers in trig notation. The equation x cubed plus 1 equals 0. We know from polynomials that this will have three zeros Knowing about our graph, it has one intercept at negative 1, and it has two other complex zeros. The way I'll solve this equation will be with factoring, using my sum of cubes formula, although it's not mine, it's everyone's. x plus 1 times 
x squared minus x plus 1. We know from this factor we'll get our first 0 at negative 1, exactly what we saw for the x-intercept. This factor will give us the complex zeros. Plugging into quadratic formula, 1 plus or minus radical negative 3 over 2. I'm going to write this more in that a plus bi form, where I can clearly see the real part and the imaginary part. So I'm looking at the three zeros, x equals negative 1, and then the two complex zeros, 1 half plus radical 3 over 2i, and 1 half minus radical 3 over 2i. Now each of these numbers we can plot on that coordinate plane using real and imaginary axes. When it comes to a number that appears just to be real, because it only has the real part, no term with i, we could think of that as a negative 1 plus 0i. With no imaginary term, it's like it has a coefficient of 0. So we'll know exactly to use a negative 1 horizontal and a vertical component that is 0. That will be a point right on the x-axis. So let's look at where these points end up. There's negative 1 on the real axis with no imaginary part. What was our second point? Positive 1 half plus radical 3 over 2i. There is that point horizontally by 1 half, vertically a positive radical 3 over 2. And where's our third point? Positive 1 half with a negative radical 3 over 2. We see some interesting symmetry among these points. Let's draw in the unit circle because each of those points does land on the unit circle. This point negative 1, 0, corresponding to the complex number negative 1 plus 0i. This ordered pair, 1 half radical 3 over 2, corresponds to the complex number 1 half plus radical 3 over 2i. And same with the third point. And what do we know about the angle measures at these points? This point here, 60 degrees. Back here, halfway around the circle, 180 degrees. And this point at 300 degrees. And definitely we can see a difference of 120 degrees. Think of the full circle, 360 degrees, divided by 3, and 60 plus 120 will get us to 180. 180 plus 120 takes us to 300 degrees. 300 plus 120 is 420, but that's the just 360 with an additional 60 degrees. So absolutely 120 degrees separating each of these three points. We'll actually see this as a law in the future. So we could use this to our advantage if we knew only that negative 1 was a 0, and we know there have to be a total of 3, means 120 degrees away. Move 120 degrees, we'll find the second root. Move 120 degrees further, we'll find the third root. And this is going to be very useful when we deal with powers and roots of complex numbers. So let's now run through a few more examples to get some good practice about writing complex numbers in trig notation. We'll take these three examples, 6 minus 2i, negative 2 plus 3i, and negative 4i. First, let's plot each of these points. 6 minus 2i, just think the real part is horizontal, the complex part, the imaginary coefficient here, this, I end up using complex and imaginary a little bit interchangeably, but I think technically we would say the term with i is imaginary, and the complex number has a real part and an imaginary part, but I'm not too picky with the terminology. Anyways, 6 minus 2i down here in quadrant 4. Next, negative 2 plus 3i, horizontally negative 2, vertically positive 3. And lastly, negative 4i. So no real part, no horizontal motion, just down 4, negative 4 on the imaginary axis. Now let's work on writing these numbers in trig notation. First, point A. We need to find the length of this radius from the origin to the point A, and we'll also need to find the angle of rotation. Let's find the radius first. We know we can do this by seeing it as the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Horizontal side, positive 6. Vertical side, negative 2. We're really going to hold on to the negative signs here, particularly when it comes to us finding the angle. So I'm just starting my habit right now. When I look at these triangles, if I'm down here in quadrant 4, my vertical part is negative. I'm thinking of my side actually as having a negative value, just for this type of a problem. It won't matter when I go to that expression square root of x squared plus y squared. These 
exponents of 2 always make positive values. We end up with 36 plus 4 in the radical. Square root of 40, we could simplify, equals 2 radical 10. There is the length of our radius. And now we need to find the angle of rotation. From before, we consider horizontally to the right as initial position 0 degrees. So this point that's down here in quadrant 4, we do need to think of this rotation counterclockwise through quadrants 1, 2, 3 into quadrant 4. But to find that angle, we will use trigonometry and first find this angle inside the triangle. We have a few different ways we could go about doing it now that we have lengths of the horizontal side and vertical side and the radius so we know adjacent and opposite and hypotenuse. The method I choose to use is tangent. That way I can use the, the numbers, the coefficients that I see right here in this complex number. I know that tangent of this angle equals opposite side over adjacent side, or y over x, negative 2 over 6, simplify a little bit, negative 1 third. And since I know tangent theta equals negative 1 third, I can use an inverse trig function. Theta equals inverse tangent of negative 1 third. It's not one of our main increments on the unit circle, so I'll need to punch this into a calculator. In degrees, I get approximately negative 18.43 degrees. And I know that I've got this negative angle measure putting me in quadrant 4 because inverse tangent only provides answers in this range negative 90 to 90 degrees, but quadrants 1 and 4. We would like to make an adjustment so that we see this angle measure between 0 and 360. So we'll add one full rotation, 360 degrees, 341.57 degrees. That's good. It is an angle measure that we know is in quadrant 4, exactly where we see this complex number, 6 minus 2i. And we have all the information we need to write it in trig notation. 2 radical 10 times cosine 341.57 degrees plus i sine 341.57 degrees. Let's go to our next point, negative 2 plus 3i. Same process, so we'll find the radius first. We know the horizontal and the vertical sides. We'll plug those into the expression to find our radius, square root of x squared plus y squared, equals radical 13 in this case. Next up is to find the angle. We'll do an inverse tangent of y over x, inverse tangent of negative 3 over 2, Punching in, we get approximately negative 56.31 degrees. Now, we know this is in quadrant 4. Um, we can add 360 degrees at least just to get this positive, but still recognize we're in quadrant 4. The inverse tangent has found slope of the line down here, but clearly our point, this complex number, negative 2 plus 3i, is in quadrant 2. We need to use the angle measure that's going to put us in quadrant 2. Using the 303 is way off. So let's get 180 degrees back into quadrant 2. Take away 180 gives us our accurate angle measure, approximately 123.69 degrees. So we've got trig notation, radical 13 times cosine plus i sine of 123.69 degrees. We can also write these using radian measure. In this case, when I punch in inverse tangent of negative 3 over 2, I get this radian measure. Again, it's putting us in quadrant 4, 180 degrees away, so I'm adding pi radians. And there's our result, radical 13 times cosine plus i sine of 2.1588 radians. Now let's hit the last point C, negative 4i. Down here on the imaginary axis, let's just try to apply the same ideas, but we'll see how they are simplified for points that are on the horizontal or vertical axis. First of all, our radius we could see very clearly because we have only a vertical component. It is our distance from 0 on the vertical axis, a distance of 4. The value of r, we usually see it as positive, and this expression will show us why. Square root of x squared plus y squared, and order I wasn't so picky about, so y squared plus x squared in this case, leaves us with this square root of 16, which is 4, and there's again where we see that positive result. So we're always thinking of the value of r as a positive number. 
And now for angle measure, I'd want to stay away from using an inverse tangent because we really ought to know these angle measures on the four axes. Zero degrees, 90 degrees straight up, 180 degrees to the left, and down is 270 degrees. So we've got trig notation right there. 4 times cosine 270 degrees plus I sine 270 degrees. If we're talking radians, we know that one too. Well, quick abbreviation there, 4 kiss 270 degrees. And here we go with radians. Down there is at 3 pi over 2. We know here is 0 radians, straight up pi over 2 radians. To the left, pi radians, straight down, 3 pi over 2 radians. And we can write that with an abbreviation as well, if we choose. Now our third point was a bit quicker to find it in trig notation because it was a point on the vertical axis, but we're going to see any angle measure that is one of those main increments on the unit circle, 30, 45, 60, or any of those reflections, there can also be a quick way through those problems. And it's not necessary, but I think it's something you ought to know about. Now we can always rely on the steps we've shown here, but let's talk about some examples that are fairly common that we should be able to see a quicker way to come up with the number in trig notation. We'll take these three examples. First, negative 4 minus 4i. Now we know since the horizontal and vertical are the same, we're on one of these perfect diagonals. But it's not 45 degrees because horizontal and vertical are both negative. So we're down in quadrant 3 at 225 degrees, or 5 pi over 4 radians. Now how about the length of the radius, the distance from the origin to that point? Well, this expression, square root of x squared plus y squared, isn't usually too lengthy, so we can always go there. Square root of 32 and simplify 4 radical 2. So we've got this number in trig notation. 4 radical 2 times cosine plus i sine 5 pi over 4 in radians and in degrees, 225 degrees. The next one, radical 3 plus i. Well, we know this i is a 1i, and just like a good visual clue is when our real term and the complex coefficient, imaginary coefficient, are the same, it's going to match up with one of these perfect angles, 45 degrees, 135, 225, 315. The other points that we know on the unit circle were the radical 3 over 2 matched up with a 1 half. That represented all these other points in their reflections. So when I see radical 3 in one term and a 1 in the other term, I'm right away thinking about, well, if it's radical 3 over 2 and a 1 over 2, I know exactly where that is. That's right there at 30 degrees. I know that from unit circle. Horizontally, radical 3 over 2. Vertically, a 1 half. That puts us right there at 30 degrees, or pi over 6. But what do I do to account for that I just threw this over 2 onto each term? Well, I just divided by 2, so I'll do the opposite and multiply by 2. And I'll put that outside of parentheses. And now I can see right away, there's my value of r. It is 2. I pulled it outside of parentheses, and I could see coordinates on the unit circle, radical 3 over 2 and 1 half. So a quick way for me to see the radius. And then let's plug in 30 degrees. And remember, our x-coordinate is cosine 30 degrees and the y-coordinate sine 30 degrees. So we're writing 2 times cosine 30 degrees plus i sine 30 degrees, or this way abbreviated. If we choose radians, we're using pi over 6. Last example, positive 2, no imaginary part. Since it's on an axis, the r value is exactly what we see equal to 2, and we know the angle measure horizontally in the positive direction is 0.